I'll just say okay. welcome Dr. Preston McLean. He's given a couple of great lectures for us, and we're very happy to have you back and right. we'll talk about yeah, I, I saw that. I'm seeing the show for the first time, and it's already clear that a few of the pictures that I picked out to talk about have some nice uh, sympathies with what artists uh, who contribute to this exhibition are doing, which is wonderful. Uh, and uh, I will, I guess, not belabor the point as far as introducing myself. I'm just, I'm Preston. I teach now part time uh, at FSU in the Art History Department and in the College of Law. Mm. And I am so glad to be a friend of Lemoyne and here with you all to talk about. Uh, this, to refer, renew, and reconcile classical revivals in contemporary art. As you can tell, I like words. I put as many of them as I can into the title of the presentation. And like, a, like a, a, a scholar and a lawyer, before we can talk about anything, we need to define our terms, right? It's important that we know. Yes, I, I, Kurt, Kurt's like, wait a second. I, I, I didn't sign up for this. This is, this is after work. I'm supposed to be escaping from those the drudgery, but uh, just so that we can we can talk and we can we can look at pictures together and have a sense of what point I'm trying to make. And the goal of today's presentation that I, I set for myself because they invited me to come and kind of put a presentation together that might be helpful in helping people see things in the work that contemporary artists are doing that are in dialogue and continuing traditions from uh, the Renaissance and classical art forms. I thought, well. Um, if you can if you can learn like three ways to think about the, the a relationship that an artist can establish with some kind of a precedent oh hey uh, that would be a good start right because we're, you can never teach more than about three things uh, certainly not in the span of 45 minutes and so the takeaway is going to be refer renew and reconcile so three night a little alliteration there as a bonus uh, and that way you can look around and think is this a, is this a reference is this a renewal or is this a reconciliation of some sort so let's talk about what I mean by those terms so the first is renew and I'm going to give I'm going to start with some examples of what I mean and then we'll break it down into the three parts and I'll show you some artworks that you may recognize from our historic our history and I'll show you some pictures from the contemporary art world that may be familiar to you because they're by some people who are um, becoming very well known and celebrated in the world of contemporary art. But if they're not, then I think you'll see that the work that's happening in the fancy galleries of London and New York is also happening in art spaces like here in Tallahassee with people who are dedicated uh, enthusiasts or professional artists who are working to create artwork and to contribute to the community that way. So the first idea is a reference, and the reference is going to be our, our starting point. To direct the attention to, to, the thoughts of, to mention, to allude, so when you see something, it's clear that what you're seeing is someone having taken inspiration, taken an idea from before, and reminding you of it, and connecting to it. And often artists will just take a, an image, and that image will become the starting point for something that they then craft around that source image. And that's a reference. And so it's the first step in becoming inspired by and integrating art history into your work. And for example, I thought I would, I'm teaching a course this coming semester uh, for the art history department on art and cultural heritage law and policy and uh, we talk about copyright is one of the, the units that we're going to cover and of course copyright infringement obviously follows copyright and people who are stealing other people's ideas and so a lot of times you wonder what's the what boundary can i cross how how much inspiration can i derive from what i'm looking at before i become a copyist before i become someone who is not original but taking someone else's idea and making it my own or passing it off as something that I created. The history of art is filled. In fact, there's very little of the history of art that isn't in a relationship with something that came before it, and that will put you in, am in among the great masters. Uh, Raphael is a great master, and Marco Antonio Raimondi was an artist who worked alongside Raphael to take Raphael's drawings. He was a prolific artist. He couldn't paint everything that he wanted to represent. He, he drew and he conceived of scenes and then worked together with a master engraver, Marc Antonio Raimondi, a name you might not know, but it's really through the work of Raimondi that we know so much about Raphael, because very few of his paintings survived, but a lot of his work survived in the form of reproductive prints, where he would take Raphael's starting drawings and then put them together into a wonderful tableau, like this Judgment of Paris scene, a very famous print from the early 16th century. If you take art history, you may recognize it. But what is maybe more important about this print and this work of art by Raphael slash Raimondi is the extent to which, so, so what, what Raimondi is doing, he's referring, to, he's referring to the myth. He's referring to the work of Raphael. 
but he's not taking it as, as his own. He hasn't really transformed it. He's being very true to the source material. He's copying. He's referencing it. He's mentioning it. He's alluding to it. But it is not a transformation yet. But what will happen is this work of art becomes so well known and so popularized because the technology of print allowed it for it to be reproduced over and over again. And Mark Antonio Raimondi was an artist who actually got into, into uh, a number of litigations with other artists who made their own reproductive prints because everyone wanted a copy of this and Raimondi couldn't make enough of them and so others started to copy the Raimondis and lots and lots of these prints were made and he hailed them into court saying, you've stolen my ideas. Uh, you owe me something for this. So the reference is the beginning. Now, if we look at this whole picture, it's very busy, there's a lot going on and we could take an hour just talking about what's in this picture. But what I want you to focus on is this part of the picture. Right? We recognize that composition. Is it familiar at all? Right? It will be when I show you what it's like not just to refer, but to renew, to take something that was from the past and bring it into your present time, to make it feel close to you in time, in spirit, in style, to take that source material and renew it. So to renew is to begin or take up again, to make effective for an additional period. That Raimondi print got kind of stale, right? People weren't that interested in looking at the artwork of the 16th century. They needed something alive, present, relevant for their lives in the mid 19th century. And an artist named Manet came along and did just that. Do you see what Manet did? What Manet did is he took the Raimondi source print and he played with it and flipped it around. And these river gods who are sitting there alongside the river while the judgment of Paris is playing out, have now become the, the luncheon on the grass, right? A piece that we all recognize is one of the world's most famous uh, paintings from the 19th century, maybe one of uh, Manet's best known uh, works. And you see that the forms of the figures from Raimondi's print now are reproduced as pre in the present day. And he's doing not just a fealty to the original source material, but he's completely transformed the context of it. And he uh, is building off of the classical tradition. We can talk at great length about this if, if you'd like when it's Q&A time or if you just want to raise your hand. But he's also uh, paying fealty to the way that uh, the female nude has been ubiquitous in representations of history of art. And you have the nude figures here alongside uh, the, the river. And you have the Judgment of Paris where uh, Paris is uh, deciding between which of the goddesses are most beautiful. And he chooses Aphrodite and that starts the Trojan War. <laughs> Right? So a lot of trouble comes when you covet and you have, you have uh, like, let's, uh, appetites towards those sort of salacious things. Um, and, and so renewal means that we don't see uh, the Raimondi print as being ours. We see the Manet as being ours, but it's connected to that past. And so renewal then, what follows renewal is what I think is um, a more penetrating, critical engagement with the the problematic nature of what this art history legacy also brings with it. It's not enough just to celebrate the past. We have to question what our inheritance means and how our lives are shaped by the influence that art has had over us in a world that's much more complicated with politics, with questions of identity, with, with questions of representation than they were in the historical past. And so what I want us to think about with reconciliation is to settle some kind of quarrel, a tension, something that's like out of balance in, within the art historical record. Uh, we have uh, to bring into agreement or harmony, to make compatible or consistent. And so to some extent, what uh, Manet is doing is he's renewing the interest that we have in the classical world through making it contemporary. But what a reconciling artist does is that they take that source and they really make it their own and try to force it into a current point of relevance. And there's a first example, which is also, I wanted to give you the, the standard example. So what, uh, what, who reconciled the, uh, the relationship between Raimondi and Manet and the present day first? It's always the same one. It's the person who made more art in the 20th century than nearly any other artist. He's not an artist who I particularly favor when I teach art history, but you can't ignore him. And it's Picasso, right? So Picasso takes the history of art and now he turns it into his own style. He composes something to bring it into agreement or harmony with his personal style, with his uh, cubism and the sensibilities of that. And he produced nearly 200 derivative works based on not 
the Raimondi print, but the Manet adaptation of the Raimondi print. And so now it's sort of a third generation removed from the original source material because we had, remember, Raphael, and then Raphael to Raimondi, and then Raimondi to Manet, and then Manet to Picasso. But Picasso's work, if, if you'll allow me to be a critic for just a minute, it isn't that interesting, right? We've seen it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's special because it's associated with this uh, person who carries the sort of imprimatur of genius, but looking at it, you kind of get it, and then you know, you're ready to move on. But what is, I think, more interesting is when we think about the reconciliation between the history of art, what do these artists all have in common, right? They're guys who paint naked ladies and share them with a world that was uh, eager to consume that type of, of art that had a voyeuristic aspect to it that was very much in the spirit of a class of owners and a class of subordinates and a hierarchical relationship towards subject matter and interpersonal relationships. So when you look at an artist like Michelin Thomas, right, a contemporary artist, this is from 2022. Right, this is fresh art, freshly uh, bedazzled. She works in rhinestones and acrylic and these wonderful compositions, very, very boisterous and alive and influenced by fashion and the world around her. Now, now Micheline Thomas uh, is an African-American lesbian artist. And so she is looking at the history of art through a very different perspective, one in which a person like herself and the people with whom she shares her life aren't often represented in an honest, and a, a thoroughgoing way. But she also recognizes the power in drawing from the history of art and making her artworks clearly recognizable as being in dialogue with this history, as being in dialogue with a powerful past which has all of the weight of history associated with it, all the problematic nature of how people lived and how people interacted through art, the power that art exerted over the way people perceive themselves in the world and their positions within the world. So seeing a work like Micheline Thomas's, Lunching on the Grass, three uh, black females after, not, wait for it, not after Raphael, not after Manet, after Picasso, right? She says, this is the work after Picasso's version, right? So continuing that tradition. So we have, now the reconciliation is when we're not, we're making it compatible or consistent with what we think today art should include. It should not be limited just to a few people whose likenesses get represented over and over again. Right? And if you look around this beautiful exhibition, you'll see right away that the artists that, the, that Lemoyne selected for the show, they're all, one, they're amazing artists. They obviously work so, so hard, and they spend so much time dedicated to their work. But they're also choosing as subject matter faces and likenesses and people from all, all classes of life. And we consider that to be expected in the time in which we live, but it wasn't all that long ago that that wasn't the case. And so when we think about referencing, renewing, and reconciling, we're going to talk now about how the history of art has done this. Uh, we'll sort of build, we'll do our little exercise again with a few other examples that I've chosen. Any questions about what we've done so far? Everybody with me? All right, thanks, friends. All right, let's go on then. Let's talk about referring. So, I, classical, right? That was one of the words that we wanted to make sure we touched on. What's more classical? than a ruin from uh, the, the Greek or Roman world, right? It's maybe the first most classical thing you can imagine, right? Now the original architecture, we don't even like, really think about the original architecture as anything other than ruins and landscapes. Like, I know a certain someone who's about to go to Greece, right? I just found out that Powell uh, is going to Greece uh, in just a week or two. Yeah, just a couple of weeks, and so you're probably going to see a lot, see lots of this. And this is how we see the classical world. The classical world we see as uh, the evidence that re remains from time that is now thousands of years uh, in the past. And there are a lot of uh, evocations of this. It's romantic, right? It's mysterious. Right? We're not, we, we can't know it, but we can appreciate it in the distance uh, that we, we have and in the imaginary spaces that open within a work like this. And so lots of artists from time immemorial have been inspired by looking at the classical world through architectural ruin. And the first uh, big kind of market example of this that I'd like to point out is the Grand Tour, which you're going on a little piece of the Grand Tour, right? And the way that artists fed the appetite that uh, the world had for souvenirs of the trips that they took. And so artists like uh, Balaki, one of hundreds of artists whose work I could have selected, that takes the world of the classical past as uh, it re remains in ruins and gives this to the tourists so they can go come home 
and put it on the wall of their salon and be reminded of the trip and be reminded of the past. And so this is a, this, and I use refer and a very reductive example of this just to start our conversation at the most basic level, right? We have architectural history. We have a painting of that architectural history. He even here represents uh, a figure who's sort of walking in the landscape. Often they'll put people who are drawing and painting in them to show how we wanted to draw inspiration from the past by looking at the architecture and by representing it in pencil drawings or watercolors or oil paintings. And then those became collectible from people who wanted to have a souvenir of where they'd gone and what they had seen. And of course, this is much more, I'm sorry, pal. I mean, your trip's gonna be amazing, but this is much more beautiful than anything you're going to see, right? Because it's idealized, right? It's transformed something which is hot and sweaty and you're hungry and your feet hurt, right? <laughs> But you want when you're home to remember the trip that you wish you'd had, and then after a while you start remembering the trip like this, right? Because you forget how, how your back hurt and you remember how gorgeous it all was. <laughs> so uh, we talked, we wanted to bring it to the 20th century. And so uh, this was pop. This is pop art in the 18th century. This is what people produced in order to feed an appetite for something that was popular and uh, sort of ubiquitous. Similarly, in the 20th century, we see artists doing the very same thing. This is Lichtenstein, true, an American pop artist, an icon of pop, right, who refers to the classical past. And he's not just referring to the classical past of antiquity, he's referring to the history and tradition of reproducing over and over again iconic images of classical antiquity for the purpose of providing a point of reference for people who want to feel an acquaintance with that past and who want to bring it into their home. And so this is a lithograph, and he produced many series of these lithographs. There are thousands of them that are, in, to some extent, an authored work of Lichtenstein, if you consider that it is uh, signed, right? And if you look at the source material, well, of course, it's clearly recognizable as having been derived from the classical past, but it's also clearly derivative of a work like Kukurani's, right? You're looking at a 20th century pop printmaker who's continuing the tradition of drawing from the classical past through its interest and interpretation in the world of art. So this is just what I think of as reference, right? It's just referring to a history of architecture, it's referring to a history of graphic representation of the architecture, and it's meeting a, a, a desire to see images like this uh, today. But it's kind of superficial, right? It's, a li it's, it's decorative, right? It lacks conceptual depth in many ways. And I think he would even admit that because the, the, the movement itself was based upon the, the throwaway culture of, of, of the printed matter that surrounds us uh, in the post-war consumer culture of America and then eventually the whole world, thanks a lot, uh, American consumer culture. So let's now move on from referring to renewing. And here I'll bring an old master, right? We need a few old master painters in order to connect to the classical world most effectively. But I've chosen uh, this El Greco uh, because it also, I think, has those affinities with, uh, with the classical antiquity, right? You can see the frieze, the way the figures are, are, are laid out there in, in kind of a flat, more three-dimensional, but it, they, they line up next to one another. The question of, uh, of, of depth and life, is it lifelike or is it spiritual? It is a dynamic composition and it is one where you, it's actually was cut down from a much larger painting. We don't even know now what the original composition might have included, but this work has become iconic because so many uh, uh, late 19th and 20th century artists saw it in this format and were amazed by it and, and decided to make it the basis for their own art making. And so this image, it represents, it's, uh, it's called the Vision of St. John. It represents, I think, the opening of the fifth seal. So we're in Revelation, right? and the world is coming to an end, and it's sort of this climactic building up of dramatic uh, episodes that will culminate in the end of the world or the, uh, the return of, of, uh, of Jesus. And, and this figure of St. John is in, in rapture as he celebrates what he sees as these figures who are the Old Testament prophets, I believe, who have come back from the dead and who are being wrapped in the garments of of, saint, of sainthood, right? So they're now going to be reunited with a world, uh, uh, sort of within a cosmological space of holiness, 
and the celestial kingdom now is populated with all those people from the Old Testament who were instrumental in making that this history come to be. And so from a formal standpoint, we recognize El Greco as having a very singular style, very clearly recognizable as, as his work. And we wonder, how can we bring this into our time? But once again, and I, I, I'll beg your apology only one, once more. The first one we're gonna, we're gonna acknowledge is that El Greco was a big influence on Picasso, right? And you can't now mm -hmm. see the work of uh, La Demoiselle d'Avignon, right? Without recognizing that he was, in a sense, riffing on this El Greco painting. And he admits as much. And there's so much you can talk about when you look at uh, Demoiselle's, uh, it, it, when you look at this Picasso, that um, it's easy to overlook that he was, in a sense, um, modeling his work after inspirational works, particularly this El Greco composition. And you can go piece to piece and see the ways that the forms that El Greco uh, created are, are mirrored in the composition of Picasso, but I don't want to talk about Picasso. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want you to go home and find out that Picasso was also influenced by this work and Preston didn't tell us that. Right, so now that I've mentioned that, we can move on. We can talk about a more interesting artist, and, and, and that's Thomas Hart Benton. Right? And this is an American regionalist, a painter who was famous for murals, uh, worked in the post, uh, the, uh, well, post war, but also during the, the 1930s, during the Depression, the WPA era. Uh, his, his murals were popular in, in, in many uh, public buildings, and he had. Uh, uh, large wall pieces for thinking like banks and, 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 and uh, offices in New York City. This was part of a series of works that he did, uh, work mural pieces for a building in New York uh, based on uh, his travel. This uh, particular image represents his trip to, through the American South. So I chose it because it has, it's, he probably was not very far away from here when he, when he turned west and he went on to Texas. He came down through Georgia. He was from Missouri originally. But at this point, his work was primarily happening in various cities on the East Coast. And he comes down and he sees and feels the kind of the spirit of the South. But he's also clearly highly influenced by the forms and styles of El Greco. He's looking at the present day and he's trying to renew our sense of now, but he's using a classical uh, old master reference to do it. And it, it, I, it becomes obvious when I just pointed out that you have that freeze-like composition. You have the forms and shaping of the bodies that are sort of distorted and elongated. You have the bright colors. You have literally the representation of a man who's in, in, in a state of rapture, a man who is, who's, whose piety and whose prayers are being directed heavenward. And then you have this figure in the back, uh, Get next to God, an itinerant preacher who's probably you know pounding his fists with the uh, fiery brimstone mm -hmm. style speaking, and then other figures who together make a very uh, dynamic and lively representation of a scene of the American South that looks quite a lot like the way that El Greco's vision of Saint John appears. Would Thomas Hart Benton's painting have been this painting if it weren't for the picture that uh, the El Greco inspiration? I think it's easy to decide that it wouldn't, that there's too much evidence that it is drawn from the lessons that he learned by looking at El Greco and wanting to renew it, wanting to make it relevant again for the time in which we live, to really reintroduce the world to the art of El Greco through a picture that's contemporary, that speaks to us now, but reminds us that the times back then were also, in, in many ways, made up of people who were like us. Another example, I want to give, try to give at least two so that um, it's easier to remember. Here's another El Greco painting. This is the Laocoon, right? a, a Greek myth right? taken from the classical past. And you can see the figures there that are intertwined, wrestling with this serpent, this sort of this, uh, uh, mythological dragon that, they, that, that they're being attacked. And the forms that El Greco uh, creates are almost dif are difficult to discern as they, as they wrap in and out of one another. How do we renew a work like this? How do we make it relevant for the present day? Uh, Benton, he, uh, he had a commission to create a painting that was uh, about, uh, it was a fictional community uh, of Chilmark. And you can see here that he took the Leagawan and he puts this together into a grouping of 
uh, of sports people. They're like sportsmen, you have ball playing, you have rowing, and he even places the snake there in the composition for us, right? You can see that we're on a river, and he's put within this Liakawan derived renewal of, of this painting, a reference directly to that source. And looking at the picture, you would see this as, a, as clearly a 20th century, mid 20th century American regionalist style artwork. It doesn't shout at you uh, late Renaissance. It doesn't say Baroque necessarily. But the forms and shapes and colors and style that uh, old master Michael Greco had perfected becomes the, the form, shape, and style of another signature artist's work uh, like Fenton. Now what, uh, what we've seen in both of these instances is that the unclothed person from the past has been dressed, right? Uh, we, we, we saw that the, the vision of St. John, he put some clothes on them, the preacher and the, the, the pious man. And here, uh, the figures, the nude figures uh, from antiquity in El Greco are rendered in their bathing suits and sports attire. Mm -hmm. And to move us to uh, even further, close to the time that we live in, let's talk about something more contemporary, more recent. And, uh, and, and you will start with this sculpture from 500 BC, Dying Warrior, right? A pediment sculpture from a temple. Right? What could be more classical than, that, than, than this? And there's an artist, and I put, I'm throwing these in just so that there's still something lively to go along with all of the, uh, the, the paintings. Here's, a, here's how do we make this new? How do we make ourselves see this as something that could be the time in which we live and not the time that we can barely imagine from 2,500 years ago? What did these people really look like? How did these people move in the world? Right? We have, it, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to conceive, but one thing that would help is to imagine these people as actual real people, dressed in clothes like ours. And so here's an artist, Leo Caillard, a French artist, who takes the original sculptures and through a very clever and very effective photo manipulation process, has his friends, men who, men who have uh, a physique, women too, who have physiques that are comparable, to uh, those of the classical models that he's photographed, took to stand, to pose in clothes, and then overlays them, really, uh, for people who work in digital art, for people who spend hours on the computer trying to perfect the way that an image appears, even though it may be sourced in a photograph, so that it is indistinguishable from something that itself existed in nature. I think that these works are wonderful, and I thought they were worthy of sharing, right? So you see, Hipsters in Stone is the series that uh, can, uh, Kayard has come up with, and we now see that these figures are renewed in a certain way, right? Like you see them differently if you imagine them in jeans and you imagine them in t-shirts. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, they weren't wearing that, but suddenly this isn't just some abstraction from the past. This is a person who really lived and really like moved in the world, it was physical and, was, and probably had a lot of the same feelings and, and, and aspects of their lives as ours. This is renewing the past and making it relevant and real then in our present. I promised that I'd give you at least uh, two examples of everything. I thought these were too good. Uh, I'll give you four, right? Just because it's fun to look at. Hipsters in stone. And you know, this is the privilege of being able to put a presentation like this together for an audience is that I get to pick the, the, the pretty art and I get to show it to you and somehow like I, I get a little bit of credit because, oh yeah, I remember what Preston showed me, that was really cool. Um, but credit to all the artists for how clever they are and coming up with this idea and then making it happen so conventionally. Just so, it's, just so everyone's aware, they aren't dressing up the sculptures and, and photographing them with the clothes on. It's all happening through digital manipulation. Right, so that's one way to renew. We've seen two ways of renewing. And so now we'll talk about rec reconciliation. I, and I'm, I'm just gonna, oh goodness. Oh, we're fine. We're only half an hour, okay. But this presentation has been running longer than I've been talking. Right? This presentation says that I was getting near an hour. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about reconciliation. And this is where it gets, uh, it gets serious. Because remember, when we define reconciliation, we're, we're balancing an account. Right? We're trying to, to correct some kind of deficiency. We're, trying to, we're acknowledging that this is, there's an incompleteness that has to be made complete by seeing something from the past seeing what it was missing and filling that missing thing in so that it is a whole for us. And that doesn't mean that we can't appreciate, admire, and, uh, and learn from art history. And I'm definitely someone who's in favor of teaching art history and continuing to learn from art history. 
But what's, su what's surprising and delightful is how much of that knowledge of our history in recent years has turned into some really fantastic contemporary art that wouldn't have existed without those art historical precedents, but that also force us to think about that art historical painting in a much different way. And the first example uh, will be this Fragonard painting. Do we know Jean, uh, Jean Honore Fragonard's The Swing or The Happy Accidents of the Swing? Mm -hmm. And I think that this is clearly a title like that. The Happy Accidents of the Swing is obviously uh, taking the position of the man who is positioned in this composition so that he can look up the skirt of the woman on the swing. Right? That's the happy accident that the painter was talking about. And so right away, you see that this is a picture that was rooted in a perspective that gives the man pretty much the right to, to put a lady the, in the position that he wants and he can admire her. And while this was a rather decorous uh, uh, variation on that theme, because she is clothed, right? we also see that there's another figure in the back pushing, and there's some puti, right? these little cherubic figures that are there, which usually signal uh, amorous love and affection. Right? So the happy acts in the swing. This is from 1767 in France. Right? And I think most of us here, a you know, learned crowd, right? we know that 1767 was, we're getting pretty late in the history of France, in uh, the Rococo period, and the indulgence, and the, the, the frivolity, right? very frivolous, very expensive lifestyles were being supported so that artists could get commissions to paint boudoirs with pictures like this, while there were a lot of people who were very hungry and starting to get really upset about how the you know, social structures of the world didn't really give them a lot, or their children a lot, to hope for. Pre-Reign of Terror. That's right, this is pre-Reign of Terror. And I'm glad you mentioned Reign of Terror because we're going to be talking about another artist in a few minutes that's connected to that. Uh, so Fragonard was not a Reign of Terror artist. Fragonard was an artist who wanted to make his clients happy. And he uh, presents us with this picture that is just pure confetti, cotton candy, fluff, uh, it's, like, it's like eating a cupcake and washing it down with like a full uh, bottle of Coca-Cola, right? That's what you've got here in this, in this picture. Um, the case that, what's interesting, and I'll, I'll note this, I, I know like too much to try to compress it into this length of time, but I want to mention that the ownership of this picture is a, kind of a mystery. We don't know who was the original commissioning uh, gentleman. <laughs> I think we safely assume. Uh, but we do know who owned it a little bit later. And we know that one, the person who owned it later, and this was in the 17, late 1780s, 1790s, uh, wound up having his head cut off. Uh, and the picture at that point, uh, we have a, a clearer provenance of where it went because, of course, lots of collections that were private prior to the people having had their heads cut off, literally, my friends, right? Uh, became property of the state and then go into public collections and then are, are bought and sold uh, and the chain of title is clear uh, within kind of the history of the picture. But we, we have that association with this picture too. And so let me show you the work of Yinka Shawnee Barre. He is a Nigerian born artist in, who's based in London and his work very often takes uh, sort of classical and Rococo and 18th century pictures particularly and he reimagines these in installations that very subtly, that the, the, the first impulse you see with, with, is, is, wow, what a interesting and, uh, and uh, sort of loyal reimagining of this. It looks a lot like the source material, right? What, like it's, it's almost uh, just too true, right? Where is the cleverness? Where is the wit? Where is the point? Well, um, how many of you have noticed the first difference between this figure and the one uh, in the painting. Time for time for professor to open no, the class. She what? She doesn't have a head, right? So the, 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 the head has been removed. Uh, and the other, the other differences are a little more subtle. Of course, when you have a painting, there's only one perspective, right? You, you look at it from the perspective that the artist decides you should be standing at, right? The artist has that power to tell you where you should be relative to the subject matter. Well, here he's taken the two dimensions, turned it into three dimensions, and now you can move around, right? Now you can look behind, now you can imagine that you're the figure in the hedges, you can get up front and look up the skirt. 
Uh, but the skirt and the clothes are different. It, the colors are similar, but these are actually done in an Ankara wax printed Dutch textile, which is very popular. And I think today we associate this tradition of, of, of printed fabric with West African culture. And the, the clothes that women will wear and, and that are very brightly colored with large geometric patterns, but this is a, 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 a form of fabric that is rooted in a very complex dynamic of colonialism. And of course, the French in the 18th century were actively perpetrating much of the violence that would have become the basis of colonial wars, and they were involved in slavery, and they had trade, the Dutch also, had trade with all the way around the world to Java and Indonesia, where they picked up the tradition of making cloth, because that cloth that was uh, created in Indonesia, it was so popular among the Dutch, they brought home, and they said, we can make this cloth ourselves uh, by using machines. They use this wax resist tradition out in, in Indonesia. They do it in a very old fashioned, labor intensive, costly way, but we have better methods of printing this. We can trade cloth that we make for what we want from those parts of the world, metals and spices and gemstones and, and those things, right, that they could get from the South Pacific. And they thought, if we make the cloth, we'll exchange it for things of value. Cloth's cheap for us. We can't get those things. Well, uh, it may not surprise you to find out that the people in Indonesia weren't all that interested in this cheap Dutch cloth. <laughs> they didn't think it was any good. It didn't match their tradition. The making of it was relevant, was important to, to the sense of identity, to the reason why this fabric mattered to them. They didn't want bolts of it being brought over from Holland in exchange for the other things that we had that the, these Dutch really are interested in taking away from us. And so they said, no thanks. And that destroyed the economy that the Dutch thought they were making with this particular cloth. And that's why am I telling this whole story? Because it, it shows you that the history of painting now becomes very relevant to a contemporary artist who's using a picture that we all recognize, everybody pretty much knows the swing, but do we know that it, it interwoven within it is a history of textiles and fashion, and an economy of how the world was built upon wealth that was based in imperialist colonial trade? So what did they do? Well, on their way back from Indonesia, they had boatloads of cloth and they didn't know what to do with it. So they stopped off in West Africa and said, are you guys interested in this? They said, yeah, that looks pretty good. And so this begins the tradition of this type of fabric making and art forms because it was not of interest to the Dutch and it wasn't of interest to the markets that they thought they were making. So Shonenare, uh, pardon me, Shonibare uh, has made her dress out of this cloth. Each uh, stitch is made out of material that shows what the clothing economy and textile economy of the 18th century was really about. And it's beautiful, but it is layered in a way that's much more sophisticated and meaningful than just a cupcake with extra frosting. So when we reconcile, we see something that is missing from the story of our history, and we try to correct it, we try to fill it in, we try to explore it. And we do it in a beautiful way, we do it in a clever way, and we do it in a way that, that um, makes us appreciate the history of art more and appreciate the artists who's in our time interpreting that for us. Just a couple of other pictures you can see uh, how the work appears up close and in person. Really fantastic, it's been installed in a number of different places. The wonderful thing about installation pieces like this is that they do come down and travel and you can see this work. This one's from about 20 years ago, I think. Yeah, about 20 years ago. Um, and I don't know the last time it was displayed, but look up these artists. Another thing that I'll say is that all of these artists, the pieces that I'm showing you are just like the thin end of the wedge. They are wonderful, clever, inspiring artists. Uh, and Shonibari particularly so because when he was a young man, he contracted a virus that uh, uh, paralyzed uh, one, one half of his body. And so he's an artist who also has a disability. A Nigerian born, English uh, citizen, who is uh, uh, disabled, but makes some of the most compelling art that you're going to uh, encounter. Often inspired by our historical precedent. 
What other sorts of reconciliation do we need? How about, how about a painting like uh, Rembrandt Peel's Thomas Jefferson, right? What could be more iconic? A single figure portrait representing, to, representing a founding father? How do you reconcile a picture like this? How do you make inspiration today from a painting that is, you know, that we made money after, right? Like our money's made after this picture, right? This is a very established representation of someone who's uh, identity within our national mythology and history is is pretty clear. But you know, today we're we're more sophisticated. We have layered understanding of what life was like in the 18th and 19th century. We understand a lot more about uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, specifically in relationships that he had with others in his life, significant others. And an artist like Titus Kaefer, right? Let me introduce you to this artist. Takes. The, the source painting and transforms it by, in this case, pulling back the canvas of the Rembrandt Peel picture and showing a representation, an imaginary representation, because we don't know what Sally Hemings looks, looked like. Right? All we have are caricatures of her. All we have are pictures that were intended to, in a sense, disparage him because his political enemies, uh, Jefferson, were well aware of Jefferson's proclivities. And they made political use of that by publishing pamphlets and screeds and uh, cartoons that uh, pilloried uh, Jefferson and represented in extremely grotesque ways of the likeness of Sally Hemings. So we don't look at those images as the source of our understanding of this person with integrity. Right? We look at an artist like uh, Kaper, who in 2014 produces a series of works like this one that is a painted representation of a canvas being pulled away to show the history that is behind it. Right? A reconciliation of that classical past and done in a way that forces us to see a different aspect of the picture than that that's on the surface. And I think you know, looking at it on its own uh, and recognizing the humanity of the subject is key. And because I wanted each artist to have at least uh, two works if possible, let me also show you a couple of other works by Titus Okay, for these, it's Billy Lee portrait in tar and on a judge portrait in tar. And Billy Lee uh, was the uh, valet uh, of George Washington, right? And much of the history of George Washington's life and campaigns in the military and in, in, as, a, as a, uh, an agrarian and as, a, as a, a politician and president ultimately is interwoven with the service that uh, Billy Lee performed. But what Kaper has done here is he's taken the classical single figure portrait, in this case, the single figures that are paired, right? You see lots of this in the history of art, where you'll have a husband and wife. Now, they were not, they were not uh, a married couple, but it's sort of rendered in the fashion of what you'd expect a married couple to show. And these are two people who are uh, connected to the history of the emergence of a, a true African-American black identity at the time of America's founding, if we think of 1776 as marking that point. And so Billy Lee, we do have a representation of Billy Lee to look at, but what uh, Kafer has done is he's overpainted that image with tar, right? To essentially wipe out the likeness, to remind us how often those likenesses are ignored within our history, within the visual culture of uh, art in the United States. We do know that Billy Lee was, uh, was a loyal, uh, I say that you know, with a kind of uh, irony, right? He was with uh, Washington throughout his life. We know that Billy Lee, and his name was William Lee, by the way, and I should have said that from the beginning. William, the artist refers to him as Billy Lee because Washington uh, referred to him as Billy Lee when he was young and it stuck, but he became William Lee. And when Washington died, William Lee was the only enslaved person that uh, George Washington's will immediately uh, uh, liberated. Others were handled in other f fashions, but William Lee to George Washington represented something so important that he felt as though this person should have his freedom, but only after George Washington passes away, of course. So here we see a representation of uh, Billy Lee. Or, or, but it's actually not a painting of William Lee. It's, of course, a painting of George Washington. And William Lee is then uh, sort of peripheral, stuck in the back, present, there to lend a helping hand, always ready 
but it is Washington, of course, who stands in the center, whose figure and form is recognized. And often, of course, you would see a picture like this, never even sensing that there's another presence in the painting at all. So, we, so Kefar rec reconciles this through his work. He's, a, he's drawing inspiration from the classical past in order to make good contemporary art. The last artist that we're going to look at uh, starts with uh, this. You talked about the terror, right? So, and after the terror, we have a, uh, basically we have a revolution in France. And if you think about like, and I'll, I'll be a little reductive right now, if you don't mind. If you're probably thinking you've been reductive all night, Preston. <laughs> but uh, I'll be a little reductive and say, you know, liberal art and conservative art, right? How about that? How about that for kind of making it real simple, right? Well, nowadays we look at this and say conservative art, right? Because it's Napoleon Bonaparte, right? It's someone who grew up to be a tyrant. It's someone who was a great imperialist. It's someone who, who re-enslaved people after they had been liberated through the revolution. But this is also someone who was recognized in their time, in his time, in this time, as being a total radical who wanted to introduce constitutions, who was, who was uh, raiding Europe in order to take people out of the, the, their position of penury and, and subservience to kings, and at least in this time, uh, with the promise that there would be some sort of uh, reform. And so uh, David, who paints Napoleon crossing the Alps, this is a hilarious painting, and one that of course in no way represents actual history. You have all the hallmarks of sort of a masculinist fever dream of martial awesomeness Right? combined with a powerful steed and a figure who looks very calm astride that, that monstrous horse. Right? As he's pointing ahead, crossing the Alps, a part of the Alps that uh, were thought never to have been traversed before and certainly not on a horse like this. In fact, we know that while uh, Napoleon did make that journey, he did it on the back of a mule. And then let's look at Wiley. And Wiley's a painter who uh, you will probably have uh, know from uh, his painting of Barack Obama. He did the pres one of the presidential portraits of Barack Obama that's in the National Portrait Gallery. A very powerful portrait of a seated uh, President Obama with verdant background in green. Mm -hmm. um, you'll, you'll recognize this artist's work. So what Wiley does is he has, he, he sources the, the figures, this is, all, this is in a sense um, taking uh, the, the sculptural uh, caprices of, the, uh, of Coyard that I showed you earlier and doing them you know, a thousand times uh, more impressively. He's taken the source painting of David and he uh, will go into the streets of New York and find people and invite them to come and dress up and pose in a way that then places them in the locations of great people from history, and I put great people in quotes, of course, so that they can, so that we can see that David painting differently. And so we can see today what our time would look like if we were using the conventions of 1801 as the way that we celebrate celebrity, power, power, influence. And so what are some of the, the ways in which uh, Wiley has done this? Like what, like, and maybe I should, pause for a second and invite you to sort of point out some things that Wiley has done to reconcile with the history of art in the form of David's uh, equestrian portrait, but also to make an interesting and powerful uh, work of art and commentary that speaks to life in the 21st century. His attire. His attire, right. So what about that attire? How is he dressed? Pardon? Mid-Eastern. He is, he's not, well, he's got this, this drape around him. He's wearing this drapery, and that's a kind of homage to the way that David represents Napoleon. But what's he wearing? Like, camouflage. Literally. He's wearing camouflage, right? He's wearing camouflage. So right there, that's a martial connection, right? He's talking about, I mean, if you think about military attire, right? He's dressed in military attire, but it's also hip-hop culture, right? <laughs> this is a person who's dressed not in the fatigues of someone who's serving in a military theater, these are the fatigues and jackets and timber, timber lane boots of someone who probably meticulously presses these clothes, right, and wears them as to, to signify sort of a, a, an affinity with popular fashion and style derived from urban, the urban hip hop scene. 
right? I have those listed in my closet. That is amazing. Right? And so and, and 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 so you have Napoleon in his riding boots, and we have this man's name is Williams. And the way that we know this man's name is Williams because you see here all the, the names of the great conquering heroes of, of antiquity. Hannibal, right? He's added Williams to the, to the block there, yeah. right? So Williams is here astride this horse. Williams uh, is wearing a bandana, right? That sort of that has a, 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 a martial connotation to it also. You know, the, uh, the, the, uh, when you wear it around your, your, your throat. The, he's wearing the camouflage, but a nice camouflage, right? This is like, this is, some, this is not like army surplus stuff. This is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is, you're looking sweet when you're dressed like this. Right? Very expensive boots, not marched to the mud, right? Polished, clean, looking good, right? And he's got the sword, and he's got the starter wristband on, right? So this is someone who's right out of today, right? But being celebrated for a powerful uh, sort of homage to what masculine strength looks like. There's also, and this is a hard thing to acknowledge, but it's a real thing to acknowledge, if you think about ur urban gun crime, and you think about the circumstances of black youth in the city, where the spaces in which they live are very often spaces in which you encounter violence that is warlike in its intensity and in its casualties. And this is, this is real to Wiley. This is what Wiley will, will digress on when he, he doesn't talk very much about his pictures. But in, and, and many artists don't, because they don't have to, right? The picture's doing that for us. So you've got the boots, and then you also have this, this garish backdrop, right? But what he's reminding you about with that backdrop, that, that brocade of gold, and, and, and is that this is all a fabrication, right? There was, no, there was no mountainside behind Napoleon. That was all concocted in the studio, right? This is all something that the artists invents. It's all an invention to reinforce an impression, to be propagandistic, right? And the world of fashion, and the world of music, and the world of hip hop in New York in 20, uh, 2004 is, in many ways, kind of impressing upon a community something like the creation of celebrity that surrounded the emergence of Napoleon Bonaparte, as maybe the first major global celebrity politician. Charles I at the hunt, the king on the hunt. How do you reconcile a picture like this? Well, you, you open it up. Who, like, everyone should be invited to, to, to promenade, to strut, right? To get out there with their cane, right? To, yeah. be, to be today, right? What in the past was reserved only for the roi, right? Now we can all be a part of a, of a world of art that was the domain of a very exclusive, privileged class. Thank you, Wiley. And then uh, to bring come full circle on my presentation, I'll show you one more painting by Wiley, and I think you'll recognize it right away. Yes, this is where we started. This is Lunch on the Grass with Ainetta, Luchimu, and Sukenya. Right, and this is from 2022, fresh, fresh uh, work by Wiley that I was delighted to find when I put the presentation together because it's nice when you can uh, start and end from uh, Raphael to uh, Kihini Wiley. Uh, this is the presentation I prepared for you all and I'll finish with the question, what is your favorite classical work of art? And what might a reimagining of that work tell us about the world that we live in today? So whether we want to talk about it together or you want to think about it as you go, it's really been a pleasure to show you some pictures tonight and to have a chance to talk about the history of art, uh, and I hope it feels a little, uh, you know, on point for the exhibition beautiful show here at Lemoyne. So thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. someone in this room who I'm looking at right now feel about being called out. I know someone. I know someone who's not 15, 20 feet away from me right now 
whose work is powerful and inspired by Caravaggio. And that's Elton Burgess. And Elton Burgess is in the back of the room uh, with that prayerful posture. <laughs> Elton's, a, Elton's a beautiful thinking. person and an amazing artist. And you can see Elton's work right now. Elton? Is it, is it up in, in town? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Wonderful. I thought, I thought I remember, I knew, that, I knew that it had been up. I wasn't sure who was still up there. There are many artists whose work is inspired by uh, Baroque painters, uh, the powerful chiaroscuro, which you will see right away when you look at works like Elton's. Um, and it's, it's, I guess it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. But yes, there are many artists. I mean, I, I, you could select a, 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 a well-known old master painter, and chances are there's someone for whom that artist like communicates something powerful, and particularly and if you don't mind, I'm not going to sit here and interpret Elton's work for the group because we're not looking at a picture, and Elton would, uh, I would have to get his uh, clear before I did that. But there's also the, the powerful religiosity of the work, and what at the root of it is sort of an expression of faith and an expression of connection to something spiritual. And you can see that in the way that uh, El Greco approached his subject matter. Mike Lan uh, pardon me, his name is Michelangelo Morisi. Uh, that was the name of, he took the name Caravaggio. But Caravaggio was also, as far as we know, we have no reason to think otherwise, powerfully moved to create contemporary art, because all art at, at, at one time or other was contemporary. All art was a radical departure from what we'd seen last season, and we don't know if we like it, right? <laughs> we think that they're doing things that they probably oughtn't to do, because the good old days were what we liked, and we want to stick with that. So the, the way that they use the techniques to take someone into a state of mind that makes them more receptive and impressed by the truth, the revealed truth uh, of, of Christianity, particularly in the history of Western art and painting. I think you'll also see a lot of those threads continuing to move through, maybe not in endorsement of, of uh, Christianity per se, but recognizing that the devices that the painters use are themselves atmospheric and psychologically penetrating and create mood and, and put you in, a, in a, a state to receive that message and be susceptible to the power of it. And there's drama, right? And we watch TV now. And TV is like what used to be novels, right? We used to read novels to get that sense of connection to a wider truth. Now we just watch serialized television. And before there were novels, people looked at paintings in churches and saw this history, this passion playing out in these images. Right? And they were moved, and they understood the world better because they vicariously felt what the saints were feeling as they were being martyred. Yeah. Not exclusively, but I, I personally see a trend toward, uh, I, for lack of a better word, Jungian, Carl Gustav Jung, you know, archetype. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. And there are many 20th century artists whose work you can't interpret without understanding the influence right. of Jung and, and, and Freud also. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question because it gave me a chance to acknowledge uh, my friend Elton who's here tonight. <laughs> it honors me in being here. Well, let me th let's just uh, wander around a little bit and chat. All right? Let me have a seat here. Thank you.